I'm thankful to you for gathering for worship here today. In spite of these circumstances, you've shown uh, a desire to be close to the Lord, and he will respond today. Now, we are going to study Romans chapter 4 this morning, but all of Romans chapter 4 can be summarized with a single verse of scripture. Ephesians 2.8 says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Do you hear me say that? Listen to these words again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Would you repeat these words with me? For it is by grace that I have been saved. For it is by grace that I have been saved. Through faith. This is the amazing gospel message. It is at once wonderful and incomprehensible and yet true. No one has been able to earn enough credit with God to claim anything as though God owed him. But God loves. And it is by grace that he gives his salvation to any and all who come to him. Isn't that beautiful? So as we study through the book of Romans, we're on chapter 4 today. Romans chapter 1 tells us that God made such a creation that it was easy to see that there is a God and that he is good. And Romans chapter 1 shows just what happens when people rebel against God. So there's that rebellious, lost soul and the rebellious lost culture in Romans chapter 1. It's obvious that this person who has rebelled against God and who lives in a culture of people who rebel against God is lost. But then Romans chapter 2 tells us of another kind of person, that person who attempts to reconcile this distance from God with morality and with good works, and a person who seeks to uh, live according to the law. And the truth is, no matter how hard we try, and no matter how much we succeed, we never succeed sufficiently, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so Romans chapter 3 tells us that no one has any hope If they look to themselves to see what they can do to make themselves righteous. But everyone has a singular hope, and that is Jesus Christ. And so Romans 1, 2, and 3 come to a, a summary in these verses. Romans 3, 23. 24 and 25 say this for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So, the gospel is, there is none righteous, no, not one, and no one can save himself, but God loves, God is gracious, and God has given forgiveness of sin and salvation through Jesus Christ, through the shedding of his blood, 
and through receiving the work of Jesus by faith. And so when Ephesians 3, I mean, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, 8 says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. We know this is true. Now, Romans chapter 4 uh, is a passage of scripture that talks about Abraham. How many of you remember Abraham? All right. Abraham was, uh, you'll find him back in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. You remember his name was Abram, which means exalted father. But God had a special connection. He called Abram. He said, go to a land that I will show you. And Abram followed in faith. And God said to Abram, you are no longer Abram, you are Abraham. Not exalted father, but father of many nations. He said to Abraham, go out and look at the stars at night. How many stars do you see? Count them if you can. That is how your descendants shall be. Abraham was considered by the Jewish people to be the father of their faith. And he was also their ancestral father. They all came from Abraham. He was their, however many greats you want to count it, grandfather. If you were a Jew, you were a child of Abraham. They took great, great uh, pride in this. Because God had said to Abraham, I will bless you and make your name great. And so you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And those who were descendants of Abraham would say to themselves, God is on our side. God said he would bless us. God said he would bless those who bless us and curse those who curse us. They, however, didn't give quite enough heed to the part where God said, and so you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. In Romans chapter 4, Paul begins to, to lay out a case for people who trusted that somehow because they had the law, the Old Testament, and perhaps somehow because they were children of Abraham, then they had a, a special place in God's favor. You may remember when John the Baptist came preaching to, about Jesus coming, he was preaching a message of repentance. And in Matthew uh, chapter 3, I don't remember the verse. John the Baptist was preaching repentance. People were coming out of the towns and villages. He was preaching about the coming kingdom of God and talking about a Messiah that would come, about Jesus. And the Pharisees and Sadducees showed up. And he said to them, you, you brood of vipers, who told you that you were going to escape the coming judgment? You need to do what the acts of repentance uh, show, the fruit. You need to show fruit of repentance. You need to repent and don't say, this is what John the Baptist said, don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. So all of that sets the stage for what we may read together in Romans chapter 4. Those who were thinking, because Abraham is my forefather, I have a special uh, position with God. That is not really the way it is. Let's read um, Romans chapter 4. We'll read the first eight verses to start. What then? 
Shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? In fact, Abraham was justified, if in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin in the Lord will never count against them. That's quoting from uh, Psalm 12. That passage, by the way, from Psalm 12 is on my great-grandfather's gravestone. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Paul began this by saying, look, now what are we going to say about Abraham? Did Abraham earn his right standing with God? No, he didn't. The Bible tells us he believed God and it counted to him as righteousness. Now that's how Paul sets everything up. And if you go back and read the story of Abraham, you don't find a man of perfect faith, do you? You find a man who stumbled out of the gates many times. You see a man who made some very poor decisions and showed lack of courage and, and uh, lack of trust in many cases. But you also see a man who trusted God. Even though he didn't live perfectly every moment of his life, he trusted God. And he believed that when God made a promise, that God's promise would be kept. And so Abraham believed God, and God counted him righteous. Folks, I want to say to you before we go any further in this sermon, if you're looking to yourself, if you're looking to what you've done, if you're looking to your own way of living as somehow a, a, a measure of God's love for you or his grace towards you, then you're looking at the wrong thing. God has called us first by his grace to say you who don't deserve you who didn't live up to the standard you who are wayward you who messed up I give grace to you if you'll trust me I'll forgive your sins and give you life eternal. And when we do trust God, like Abraham, we learn to walk in his ways. And he transforms us. And he reveals himself to us. The first thing I want you to see today is that God's grace is for everyone. The problem that these who trusted in their religion had problem with the Romans too kind of unbeliever is they try to earn their salvation by the things that they do they try to 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 um, just show that they're putting enough effort into it the problem with that is you start to compare yourself not to God who is the standard for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but we compare ourselves to other people that we know and we generally try to find people that we compare favorably to when we compare ourselves. Well, at least I'm not like that guy over there. Remember the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector? He did just that. Also, the problem with looking at your own moral upstanding life in comparison to someone else's rebellious and sin-filled life is that 
you can fall temptation into the temptation of becoming jealous of the grace that God bestows on others. You see, grace is, is unfair. I mean, it's God giving us what we don't deserve. There's no fairness in that. <laughs> we deserve punishment. It seems like none of us have a problem with the unfairness of forgiveness when we're the ones being forgiven, do we? Oh God, thank you for forgiving me. But we seem to have a big problem with the unfairness of forgiveness when somebody else is the one being forgiven. You ever notice that? We think that maybe they don't deserve the forgiveness they're getting. Well, of course they don't. That's why it's called forgiveness. That's why it's called grace. What Paul really wanted to do is to open up the eyes of self-righteous people to say, look, put yourself in anybody's shoes and we're all standing in the same shoes. There is none righteous. We all need grace. We all need forgiveness. And we all need God to provide it for us. Abraham didn't earn his salvation. He received it by grace. Your forefather and your forefather in the faith believed and it was counted, credited as righteousness. He received it by faith, by grace through faith, not by works. So let's continue reading. Verse 9. Paul continues. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? In other words, for the Jews or for the non-Jews too? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe, but who have not been circumcised, in order that the righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Long-winded statement there boils down to Paul saying this, Abraham is the spiritual forefather of the Jews who are saved through faith in Jesus. He is also the spiritual forefather of the non-Jews, the everybody else, anybody in the world who hears the message of believe in Jesus and receive him and be saved. Abraham is the forefather. Now, how many of you, would you just raise your hand, did you go to church when you were a child? Okay, when you did, did you sing that little song, Father Abraham had many sons? Yes, I mean, I did. That was a, that was a staple in children's church, right, in Sunday school? And it, it was really the song that the Sunday school teachers used to get all the energy out of the kids so they would settle down and listen to the Bible story. So you'd say, Father Abraham has many sons, and you would be doing your arms and your legs. It's kind of like the Christian... Uh, uh, hokey pokey, you know, uh, he had many sons, right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, head, turn around, sit down, and then hear the Bible story. But here's the way the song went. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Anyone who believes in Jesus can claim Abraham as his father, just as John the Baptist had said to those Pharisees and Sadducees, don't say you're saved because your forefather is Abraham. God can raise up descendants of Abraham from these stones. Now it gets personal, starting in verse 16. This is going to be good. 
Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. So this became very theologically profound. Abraham had lots of physical descendants, but if you look at the promise that God made Abraham when he gave him his name, father of many nations, there was encapsulated in that that it would be all the peoples of the world, not just that line of Semitic Jews that, that uh, were descendants of Abraham, but that people in China and Africa and South America and Australia and everywhere else in the world would be able to say, I have put my trust in Jesus and because of that, Abraham is my father. So that Revelation 7, 9 will be a reality where it says, uh, I saw a great multitude more than anyone could count. People from every nation, tongue, and tribe, and people standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That picture of the church in Revelation is every nation, tongue, and tribe, and people. And that is the many nations that was promised to Abraham in Genesis. I love this. It says, he is our father, Abraham is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. And what does that mean? Well, one, God is the God of the living, not the dead. He brings people back to life, and that's been proven through the resurrection of Jesus. But also for Abraham, because he was a 100 years old and still didn't have his descendants that God had promised, right? So we read about this real quick. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as had been said, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. Fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. That is a great picture of faith right there. Now, this needs to be applied properly. We have this scripture that says that God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that are not, and that God is able to keep his promises. Now, there are some who develop theologies and, and even churches where they, they do this name it and claim it thing. Call into existence things which you're not. Name it and claim it by faith and God will give it to you. Conceive it, believe it, receive it and God will give it to you. And uh, we see a lot of uh, neo-Pentecostal and false gospel, prosperity gospel type churches that come out and say that faith, the faith of Abraham is the faith of becoming rich or the faith of claiming your blessings. That's not what this means. This means claiming God's promise of grace to the sinner. And that's a promise that God will keep. O oh, sinner, no matter how self-righteous or how far fallen you are, O oh, sinner, there is a promise that God keeps every time. And that is he will give grace and forgiveness for sin to all who believe. In fact, that's what these last verses tell us. This is why, 
Well, let me read verse 21 again. Abraham being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it is credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the thing that you can name and claim. This is what you can conceive and believe and receive. Not magical, nice, fun things for this life, but forgiveness and grace from God when you need it most. Abraham believed God, that God would forgive him of his sins, that God would keep his promises, that God would give him life everlasting. And this is the same promise that you can believe and claim. What is the message? What is it that needs to be believed? God, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. We believe that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Folks, God didn't just tolerate our sins. He didn't just say, oh, that doesn't matter. He didn't just excuse them or condone them. But God, in his just and holy nature, punished those sins with all his wrath. But then, in the person of Jesus Christ, he stepped in and took that punishment himself in our place. So that God could be just punishing all sin and the justifier receiving the punishment for all sin and giving us grace that to all who believe he gave the right to become sons of God. This is a message for you and me but not just you and me it's for everyone. And we can't say, oh, I've got, my, uh, I've got my church. I'm good. I live a good life. That's why God favored me. No, no, no. God favored us because he is gracious. And he'll favor everybody else out there in the same way. No matter how far fallen and how reprobate they are, if they will receive Jesus, he will give them the same grace he gave you. Can we share that gospel with others? I want to just tell you one story before we have our invitation. I've been reading, been reading a little bit about uh, the spread of the gospel through China. I've been reading a book called Kingdom Without Borders. On page 42, there's a story about a church in China that... Uh, They were convicted that they needed to take this good news to the tribal people of South China, the ones in the, um, the Hainan province, which is the southernmost part of China and it faces Vietnam. And so this church put together a group of people and they went there. And when they arrived, the, the indigenous people said, you Chinese have only been here for 500 years. And you think you can come and take the place? Take our place? We serve the gods of the mountains. And you've come to take our gods. We're not going to let you. You're invaders. And so these indigenous peoples rushed 
that group of people from the Chinese church and beat, beat them. And they got a hold of one whose name was Wang and beat him to death. The church went back and met again and prayed for three weeks and said, we need to go another time. We need to try again. And Wang's wife, Leon, she said, I want to go. He said, no, you've lost too much already. This is too dangerous for you. She said, no, I need to go. I, 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 God wants me to go, and I'm going to be a part of this group. So three weeks after they had tried to reach this group of people, and one of their own beaten to death, they went again. Let me read this to you. For three weeks, the whole church grieved. For three days, they prayed and fasted. Then they sent the mission team back to the site of the murder. What would they encounter? Surly looks greeted them, but before anyone on either side could open their mouths, Leon took a few paces forward and raised her voice so that she would be clearly heard. I am the widow of the man that you killed three weeks ago. She said, shock covered the villagers' faces. My husband is not dead, however, she continued. God has given him eternal life. Now he's living in paradise with God. When he came here to your village, he wanted to tell you how you could have that life too. If he were here now, he would forgive you for what you did. In his place, I forgive you. I can do this because God has forgiven me. If you want to hear more about God, meet us under the big tree outside of town this evening. So villagers went. And the mission team said, well, they'll listen to her. So they told her everything they wanted her to share. She shared the gospel. And then Wang, Wang the one, uh, his father, Wang's father, the, the, the father of the one who was killed, he stayed behind when the team left, and he stayed for three months, teaching them what the word of God said and baptizing them. Months later, Wang's father showed up at the home church with three men from the new Lee Church, that's the tribe. During the service, these young believers gave greetings. I am the man who murdered Wong, one began. There was a hiss of indrawn breath, but the congregation listened as the Lee man told how God had forgiven him. He asked forgiveness from God's people, he expressed an eternal debt of gratitude, and brought a money gift from the new church to show thanks to the church that had sent them the good news. The grace of God is that he will forgive the worst of our enemies and redeem and restore them completely. I hope that our church can have the kind of faith that this church had. I hope that we can be as faithful with the gospel as this church. Because the Bible tells us plainly this message of grace is for all who believe. And everyone who comes. We're going to have a song of invitation now. If God is calling you to come forward, give your life to Jesus, then you can do that. Let's pray. Stand with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, would you touch our hearts?